one day they would like to decide that you need to go, they can literally delete you with a click of a button. It's one thing for somebody to come and inflict pain on you, but if you're choosing it, it's a whole different experience. I was automatically assumed to be someone potentially dodgy, questionable, not that trustworthy. If it's worth doing, it's worth dying for. Marius, have you ever been deprivileged? What do I mean when I say deprivileged? Okay, so here's the concept. Uh, I was walking along with somebody who would be more um, somebody on the fringe of society, less, a bit more uh, ostracised and kind of pushed out. And I experienced somebody, just as we pass, just the reaction, that kind of like, uh, which was alien to me. I, that's not something I'm used to. So is that because I'm a certain amount of privileged, look okay, male, white? Yeah, maybe it is about that. But what I was interested in is the feeling. Like, I I didn't really like that. So my, I, my question to you isn't so much about privilege and race and all that sort of stuff. It's not so much about that. It's like, when did you last... Like, so, so I see you and I see how people respond to you. And lots of people speak to you and you, you seem to get respect, yeah? You look smart, presentable, healthy, fit, the right demographic, all those things, which, we, which, which gives you those things. Fine, nothing wrong with that. The question is, when did you last, when were you last on the outside? When did you feel uh, alienated, isolated um, by peers and, and society and kind of like look down upon? Got an excellent example. As you said, I normally try to dress smart and present myself a certain way because, you know, my job requires uh, that of me, which is fair enough. And uh, there's this situation that happened not that long ago that uh, I, I got called uh, by one of my clients who asked me if I could interpret for him at the police station. And uh, I said to him that, you know, unfortunately, as I've been exercising, so my dress code is not really appropriate, but he really, really wanted me to come. So ultimately, I went over and I started to interpreting. And afterwards, we went to the, to the parking lot of the police station so we could contact uh, his solicitor. And as we were standing there, Literally two, three minutes later, two police officers, you know, approached us and started questioning, you know, what we're doing and why we're there. So I've explained to, to these guys that, you know, I'm an interpreter and I'm here to help the client with this and this and we're just contacting a solicitor now. And he looked at me as if, you know, like, right, you're an interpreter? You just look like some sort of, um, I don't know. But the bottom line is... Because I didn't have my normal clothing on. And ultimately, you know, the people, well, the police officers took my details. I didn't have a problem with that. But it felt horrible. It felt that I wasn't given the respect that I'm used to. Only because the way I dressed at this particular moment. So this could be one of the examples that shows you it, it doesn't really matter, you know, who you are. What matters is how you're being perceived by others in today's society. So this is an example. Yeah, so it's a good good example. Um, and so you get to dip your toe a little bit and feel what it's like to be the other, the outsider. I guess the question is, that's a different experience from being the outsider for a longer term. And we were, how does that affect someone to, to be on the outside a lot? to spend the majority of their time on the outside, discredited, sort of uh, easily abused, easily discounted. How does that affect, the, and, and like, who are those people? Okay, so we'll take the guy. There's obvious things of non-conformity, so looking a bit scruffy, 
the beard, kind of um, the, the the manners of speaking, which don't seem refined and polite, but a bit more aggressive, and and it and it's like a bit like chicken and egg. Is there a certain amount of cultivation? And I guess the the point is, as you brought it up, is sometimes somebody could fit that mold, and it's easy to discredit them. And sometimes it's utilised as a as a way to discredit. It's like, oh yeah, you pick on those little things to to dis- discount them. Uh, but it's not. And so the ideas are you don't bother to think about or conceptualise the ideas because it's easier just to go. You've already discredited the person, absolutely. Uh, and 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 it feels like that happens a lot of the time. It's it's a tactic that's used a lot of the time to discount ideas. It's just like, well, discredit the person. It's ad hominem. Ad hominem attack. What you've got to say is not it's not right because you're not right, and it's like so obviously uh, that's nonsense. It's like you must be stupid. There's no point of elaborating or even considering what you're saying is because uh, you're one of these guys, and uh, since you're one of these guys, uh, then you know anything that comes out of your mind mouth is is nonsense. And the sad thing is, it works really really well. That's how people you know, perceive, uh, you know, everyone else, it worked as magic. If, if let's say somebody says something of a meaningful value, but you don't really have, you know, any decent argument uh, to counter argument what the pers- person is saying, well, you can look, you can try to dig in their history, find something that you can utilize just to discredit them as a person. And it's a, it's a horrible state of affairs because these people, even if, let's say, that particular person said something that would be completely crazy at one time in the past, it doesn't mean that every single thing that they will say for the rest of their life is going to be complete garbage or nonsense. And I think that all of us should be able to understand and appreciate it that when other people are speaking and they're trying to present something that's not necessarily in accordance with a, a general wisdom, I think it's important to always listen to these people and perhaps consider what they're saying rather than automatically discredit them completely because of something they did or they said in the past. It's it's a shame, but that's the tactics that are being used these days to allow you know certain authorities, a, a, I don't know, how do I say that? They don't have to challenge the, the idea because all they will do, they will just challenge the character. And that way, the matter goes away in, instantly. And that's a sad thing. I don't understand why more people are not raising questions like, okay, okay, it, it doesn't matter what that person did in the past. You know, I really want to listen to what he's saying now. And perhaps there's some other esper- expert that could, you know, uh, have a debate with him. So... That way, if he's really saying, you know, lots of nonsense, that would be fairly easy for you to to present it if you're going to present another expert, let's say, from the same field and ask them to discuss these ideas on open forum. But this is not happening. No, and maybe justifiably so to some extent, because like there's so many voices. Of course. And it takes a lot of energy and time to listen to somebody. And so by necessity, like as human beings, we first impressions. So those are really useful because you've got to go on and and go through your life and you've got lots of things to get done. You can't consider every single thing people are saying. So there's a certain legitimacy about that. I guess my point is when it's so utilised overall as the structure where you just discount, 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 discount to just have this one stream of mainstream idea, there's a lot of dangers in that as well. And, and and like you said earlier on in a in a different conversation we had, you said that you pointed out that there's been some groundbreaking ideas in the past that have changed the way that were true and changed the way we saw things, but were said by people who were discredited and discounted because their idea was out of the box and it, it people couldn't conceptualize it. And I and, and like had that been lost, like we lose something. So the point is, how do we? Yeah, the point is, how do you still get the benefit of the people's ideas? And also, like from a humanity point of view, you'd... the only way you can change it is by changing the way you look at people and changing the way you assess information. And understanding one thing, 
that all the media have got their own agendas, own biases, and the way the information is being delivered to you is, is for a reason. It's not accidental that these things are being said that way. And it's easy to discredit person rather than idea, much easier than discredit the idea, especially if idea is just a hypothesis that's not been tested. But it looks like, you know, that in today's society, we've got these, these key words that we use. And when you hear someone, let's say, oh, that's just conspiracy theory, automatically you completely dismiss every single thing that that person said because he is a known conspiracy theorist. And at that point, it, it, it's a really, really scary world that we live in, especially with everything that's going on uh, in the world just now. And the ideas that, let's say, a couple of months ago were named uh, conspiracy theories right now are everyday reality. So this is really important for other people to also recognize that we've got a really short memory, that something that we thought that it was true three, four, five months ago. We no longer remember because of the way the new information is being presented. All the old, old information being reframed just for you to 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 to, to understand it in a uh, I don't know in a different way, I guess. So uh, the, the the biggest problem is that we need to think more for ourselves, and we need to challenge our thinking. And we have to start, but it's not, we have to start, as you said, it's not easy to change it, you know, because the societal norms uh, will create certain biases in people. And as I've given an example at the very beginning, if you dress well, and if you speak, uh, you know, in a certain way, you're going to be automatically taken more seriously than you would be taken even with a PhD, but looking like a homeless person, for instance, not insulting homeless people, of course. Mm, I, I, I'm developing a different, my, my thinking on it. And I guess what I was visualizing there as we were speaking was people as like one moving, uh, heaving entity. I guess it's like the idea of um, Rome. So the, in Rome, the, 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 Not the crowd, the the mob. The mob is Rome. So it's one heaving entity of of conceiving to a certain extent together. Uh like they're all individuals and that's what lives on the mainstream. It's that main idea. It's a, it's it's the main body of people. And there's lots of things that come and affect that. And that's a, I suppose the scary thing is that's a huge beast, like massive, because previously in history, you had all these smaller heaving bodies and that they're fighting in Europe and you've got the, the, um, the barbarians, you've got all the Goths and the Mongols and you've got Rome and you've got these different communities of big bodies of people who are uh, being motivated and moving with, with a shared kind of mainstream idea for each of these ones. Whereas now, not only do we have so much, so much more amount of uh, numbers in terms of the population of the world, like that's exploded um, from whatever it is, one billion a couple hundred years ago, 400 years ago, or whatever, to, to almost eight billion now. But there's so much unity. There's so much unity of ideas and con concept. There's still lots of, the, of bits, but it's such a massive body, and, and and how does that work? Like that's that's the future, and how does how does ideas? And I guess that's what we're wrestling with a little bit, because um, we are all individuals, but at the same time, there's an aspect in which we have corporate ideas, and and we're affected by each other, um, and you see that, and like I see it as well. I see I see uh, how when enough people sort of acquiesce or, or, or promote a way of thinking like this is the normal way of thinking and if you're not then you're an outlier it affects me as well and, and I would say I am more of an outlier sort of person than, than many so I'm not surprised when I see people who are less outliers are more in the middle of that beast and less like questioning things maybe why they move along with that it's like well it makes perfect sense why wouldn't they if it even affects me on the outside then 
Um, and so I guess that the challenge is as well is, is if you're going to be on the outside, because if you're going to follow some certain ideas and different stuff, then you will find yourself on the outside. And how is that? So I guess it's the idea of risk assessment. It's like, I've been doing this a little bit myself lately. It's like, what what does it feel like out the, on the outside? Because I, I guess I've been on the outside at some points in my life, but, but now... Um, but now I get certain amounts of respect. I'm kind of used to that. I'm used to the comfort and all the rest of it. And what would it feel like to be, to be the other, to be the guy who just gets stepped over on the street? Uh, it's not a nice feeling, trust me. Yeah, well, I know because I've had it. But like the difference is I had it not because I chose it. Whereas I think what they suggest is when you have nasty things, when you have pain, it's one thing for somebody to come and inflict pain on you. But if you're choosing it, it's a whole different experience. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a bit of a ridiculous... Do I want to say, okay, so, so I had a couple of plucks on my neck and I got a slightly eccentric friend to perform some surgery on me with a solder and iron. So here's the idea. He would just like... But I had control, but he, he would just touch it on and like burn, burn, yeah? And I would say like, how, how painful... Like what number from one to 10? And if it got over seven, then... Like pull it away, so so I have control of the pain, and it's a whole different experience. It's still there's a certain level of unpleasantness about it, but it's it's all changed. It's your perspective changes, and I guess I'm I'm thinking maybe there's an aspect to that with the the being on the outside. The difference with the outside is it's, it's short term with the pain, whereas with the outside, that can be you. You're on the outside, and previously in history, that probably meant death because you no longer have the protection of your community. You're exposed to all that challenges of life, but without being part of the throng, the group. Uh, and in today's society, it's also possible, maybe not to die literally, but to die digitally. For instance, mm, even for, mm. for the ideas that we're discussing, you know, it's wonderful. We're, we're creating something, something special, but ultimately we are at will of these big tech giants. And if one day they would like to decide that you need to go, they can literally delete you with a click of a button. So that's also really important to consider. And this is, there's a price for telling the truth these days. And not many of us are able to pay that price. We simply can't afford to pay that price. So... Could anybody, could anybody ever have afforded it though? Yeah, yeah, I they think could. so. The, there are some people, as I mentioned earlier, if you diversify the, your, your your income sources, if you could potentially be immune uh, from from these giants, like you know what I mean, immune. If you're big enough, you've got if you've got the big enough uh, following crowd, let's say these people, even if you get cancelled or if you, something happens, these people will help you to fight for your right and hopefully to get reinstated. But if you're not big enough, if you don't know the right people, unfortunately you will disappear and most likely no one will hear from you ever again. Because these guys, these giants got this power. So I'm thinking- like that, like that, 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 So that's, that's a challenge and that's a cost. That's a, bad, that's a high cost. But my, I guess my point is when I'm thinking about a lot of history's heroes who the cost for them was a, a painful, torturous death. So no, we're living in a wonderful. No, no, well. I know. If you uh, if you put these two together, obviously, you know, we're living in a wonderful society today because the worst that can happen, you just won't have a platform to speak to anybody else, uh, and and you'll still can you know you can continue living, but what sort of life is that going to be if you invest you know everything in creating something special, and then it's being taken away from you because somebody decided that what you're saying is is not the right way of thinking. I guess it's the principle, if it's worth doing, it's worth being crucified for, <laughs> uh, or yeah. dying for. Is it, if it's worth doing, it's worth dying for. So. In, the, in, you know, in, in ideal world, that is, that is the truth. But well, in well, well, reality... I, I, no, I think in reality. I think that's the thing, because that is the reality. The reality is, if, if it's going to... The reality is that the cost might be that high. The cost might be your death. Uh, and whether you say, whether that's a digital death, it's still a death, like it's different. I mean, we have a different society now. We don't tend to, uh, we don't tend to 
torture physically and, and kill people so much, we maybe do it more psychologically, which is maybe not any less of a, and a different again, pain. But. And there's, a, there's another aspect, you know, if you've got nothing to lose, it's okay. If you've got a family to support, you've got other people that depend on you, that puts it, you know, in a completely different context. It's not only you that are going to suffer. There are going to be other people who will suffer together with you. And the bigger you become, you know how, you know how they say, you know, the, the bigger they are, the harder they fall. So I, I think that's, that's exactly what I mean. The, 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 the bigger you become, easier it is for these outside forces to control you because we've got lot, lots more to lose. So it's, it's complicated. It's complicated. It's not easy uh, to come up with some sort of solution for that. And I don't think that we're here to, to talk about solutions because I don't think there's anything that I could you know, think of that would work as a magic, uh, magic bullet to solve the issue. Well, the good thing is, even if you are... So what's the difference? So in history, I think there's no difference in consequences because if you're physically tortured and killed, it's still going to have that same massive impact on those who depend upon you because your source of income, all these things. So it's, it's the same co same cost, whereas now it's maybe like you're psychologically killed and, and digitally killed, but it still has that big impact on the family. So those are still just pretty similar as they always have been in reality, historically and in, in, in the modern world. However, at least you can potentially come back from a, uh, a digital and a psychological killing. Like there's a potential to come back from that, whereas physical, not so much so. Um, and yeah, I suppose that's a, a slightly nicer aspect to that in the modern world. You're absolutely right. And that's why as much as I love YouTube, I think this is probably one of the biggest things that have changed my life and one of the most wonderful creations of, of human ingenuity. Uh, but at the same time, because they're so big, and they've got so much power, it's it's scary. I think that the, the, the ideal solution would be to have a platform that allows you to freely express, you know, yourself without the fear of being ridiculed, without fear, fear of being cancelled. And I think this is where we're heading. I think that ultimately we will have these freedom platforms that will be able to express ourselves. But the question is, is there going to be enough people like you and me who would be, who would be interested in these type of ideas? W would it be so useful to us to be? Would we be able to differentiate so easily if you had that platform? Like one of the beauties, one of the things that helps us identify something that's that's worth listening to is uh, seeing somebody say something which it might cost them very like it cost them a lot to of say course. It. And, and 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 that and so if you took that away how would you be able to what do you to mean be able to tell? That away? that's exactly what i'm trying to promote i want more people to be able fully express and tell the truth and that way influence you know other people's thinking and 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 even consider ideas that they never thought about before and if you have a big giant that will basically control what it is okay to say and what it isn't okay to say that's that's the biggest biggest problem because there are so many ideas that will never be discussed because of the fear of being cancelled, of being deleted. So yes, this is exactly what I'm arguing, but I think that from a slightly different angle. But how would you be able to, diff as an individual, listening to, accessing those ideas, how would you be able to differentiate what is a good idea from a bad idea? <sighs> because there's no cost involved. So it's like, like you can spout off ideas all day long and it's like, well, how you really know uh, if the person really believes in that is, is, is to do with, it's intrinsically linked with what it might cost them to present that idea. Like it's, it's like a, it's like when YouTube promotes a video, yeah, at the front of the, the things. It's like that's how we as humans have videos promoted to us. It's like, well, this guy is willing to, to say this even though we can see that this could cost him a lot. Uh, so it highlights ideas to us. It highlights ideas that are clearly very important to that guy if he's willing to risk. Like the more somebody's willing to risk, the more attention you, the more attention you're going to give that because it's like, hey, this is interesting. Like I think we're wired that way. We're wired to, 
to things to, to, to have things like that brought to our attention. I think it's. Uh, You're right, but what you have to understand is that oftentimes these people who are putting so-called their life on the line by you know exploring these dangerous ideas, you know, if you look at the the biggest channels of a people who who speak the truth, who are asking us to. Uh, to, to, to promote, you know, this critical thinking are people who already have a leverage, are people who already have got, you know, right connections and it's not as easy to get rid of them. They wouldn't be able to discuss certain ideas if they didn't have that, if they didn't have that backing from other, you know, uh, people of authority who could potentially help them in this if, if anything goes wrong. So did they grow that backing? Or, or were they just given it? Were they just, were they just um, born with a silver backing spoon in their mouth no. or they grew it? Well, that's, the, that's right. So the yeah. point is that they, they by and large grew it. So they grew it by putting themselves out there and saying the things which they believe to be true. You would hope, or they were good at manipulating and influencing. Like, there's different routes to get to a platform. Um, you need to be plausible. And so... But the, the, the good way, so it's without looking at the, the routes which you would say, hmm, don't really think that's a healthy way to get that, that platform, looking at the good routes, the, 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 the healthy route in my eyes is somebody who's willing to um, pay the cost potentially, or the potential cost. Like you hope that they, they won't pay that cost. You hope they'll be, and they hope they won't pay that cost. They hope that people will listen to this idea and, and value it and see the reality that they think they see and adapt and change, uh, there's not a guarantee though. And so that's the potential cost. The potential cost is that they'll be rejected. I guess it's the idea like with, Plato, with uh, the allegory of the, the cave. Uh, Plato, Plato, is, that, is it Plato? I think so. I think so. So, so the guy uh, kind of is more woken up to the reality of uh, existence. And then he, when he goes back to try and share with the others who just see the shadows of things and not the actual things themselves. Uh, well-meaning, but they kick his ass and uh, that doesn't go so well for him. And they, they, they chase him away. because to understand that. Because, yeah, for whatever reason, they maybe think he's attacking or... or yeah, uh, it's, it's, like trying it's, to, it's like trying to explain colours to the colourblind person. And they don't really have a concept. They can understand, you know, on some superficial level what that means. But in reality, if they can't distinguish, the, you know, the, the, the colours, they won't have the same experience. Kind of. It might be a bit more like trying to explain colours to uh, a tribe of colourblind people and you've just stumbled into the tribe and you, you're, you're like, you're like you try to explain and they're like, if they don't accept it, then they might Even be better. Cost. <laughs> Even better, try yeah. to explain the vision to a blind person person who was born blind yeah, this is a yeah. concept that that person cannot grasp the visual cortex never developed in that person so they have no understanding of it well i like your analogy the problem is is you, you don't and you don't have any the power you're not reflecting the power thing in there so how does that come in because i think the difference is with this throng this heaving mass that's who you're trying to explain this idea to and if they don't take that on you are vulnerable that's the reality. You are just a one person. So we need more people. That's the thing. Ideas well, that's movements. Are infectious. Uh, yeah. And you know, I think that as you said, and I think that movement is growing. I think that there's a one thing that being presented to us by mainstream. And uh, on the other hand, there's reality. And reality potentially looks completely different. There are certain ideas that we're being forced to believe in. But on the face of it, the reality looks completely different. But the problem is, not very many people are actually questioning this. So, so I ideas only infect those who are willing to pay the cost, I think. Does, does, that, does that sound right? It does sound right. Because if they're not willing, then, then you're not going to start a movement with ideas because nobody, they're just going to reject them because they're like, well, it's not my interest. So the only way you, you bring about, uh, the, the ideas will change things. You have to attach a meaning and you need to attach a value. And they need to, to accept that. Yes. Otherwise, there has to be their value as well. And you're right. It's not easy to do. It's, it's a glacier process. And you can't really change somebody's mind, you know, after one conversation. And it, even if the person says, oh, yeah, I've changed my mind completely. It takes time.